Well, good morning. Welcome, you stalwarts. This is really great. I'm so glad you came out. Um, people are just coming in. Find a seat. Move on up front if you like. Um, there you go. Welcome to the Sierra Fund's third mining summit, Reclaiming the Sierra. My name is Gary Parsons, and I serve on the board of the directors of the Sierra Fund. This conference has been nearly two years in the making, and we are excited to see all of you here to share what you know. The time is right for the issues to be discussed and the priorities to be described. I'm here, personally, because this topic affects my family and business quite directly. I live next to and am surrounded by legacy hydraulic mine diggins. Up on the San Juan Ridge, between the South Yuba and the Middle Yuba, at about 3,000 feet, you can find a few things. A wonderful forest filled with small holdings and rural homes served by individual wells, and some enormous legacy hydraulic mines. So that's the South Yuba and the Middle Yuba. If you go on Google Maps, the satellite views are incredible. It looks like the denuded aftermath of some great cataclysm. In the uh, industrial phase of the gold rush, this is after the romantic phase of the guy out there with the gold pan and the little mule, entire creek systems were diverted to power huge water cannons that washed millions of tons of debris and sediment down the Yuba. They were after the gold that was there in the bottom of old riverbeds uplifted by the Sierras. In the case of the Cherokee diggings, where I live, they could only cut as deep as the fast-filling creek beds could drain the diggings. Unlike Malakoff diggings, which is a state historical park, a couple of creek beds up, there was no drain tunnel to get rid of the miasma. So that means the richest gold concentrations were never reached. There's still a huge amount of gold in the old cemented gravels of the Cherokee diggings. So flash forward 120 years, and not much has changed except a community has formed around the mine. Wells have been drilled, homes have been built, a school, a clinic, businesses, all depending on well water coming from the same fractured bedrock aquifer underlying the deep, rich gravels of the adjacent mine site. In the mid-90s, 1990s, the Siscon Mine Corporation acquired the mine, sold the county on the idea that dewatering the gravels would not affect neighborhood wells, dug a tunnel to the deep gravels and started pumping. Immediately, the closest neighbor's well disappeared. A sucking sound could be heard. You could, you could put your ear on the top of the well borehole and hear this faint whistling. That was the water being drawn down by the mine's pumps. Then, in September of 1995, the mine works blasted open a huge high-pressure water-bearing fracture. It filled the mine within days flooded equipment, and the subsequent pumping of an estimated 9 million gallons of water per day directly into local creeks resulted in the dewatering of 12 more wells, including the school and the cultural center. So this caused the county to commission a new hydrologic study. Imagine that. And guess what? It was found the fractures do communicate with the gravel body, and nobody is really sure how many or where they all are. The mine operator was obliged to drill new wells for impacted parcels. The new wells were often of poorer yield and due to the need for greater depth, needed more power to pump, another hardship for rural folks living off the grid. The price of gold fortunately started falling and the cost of the mine operation itself started to increase, such that the stock price of Siscon collapsed and the mine ceased operation. So the pumps stopped and the subsurface water levels on the ridge started to rise. This is where it got really, really interesting for myself, my neighbors, my school, my cultural center. We thought, great, the mine has done their thing, it collapsed, it didn't work, they've stopped, the water's gonna come back. But there's a wildly unexpected consequence of re-wetting a dewatered and oxygenated rock aquifer. The level of dissolved minerals spiked to toxic levels. The iron, for example, went from 40 parts per million to 44,000 parts per million. It was undrinkable. For several years, I think eight, the kids in the Grizzly Hill School drank their water out of a little screw-top plastic bottles. That whole experience of being a kid on a playground and running over to the drinking fountain did not exist at that school. 
So, aluminum, magnesium, who knows what else. The wells along this breached fracture have never recovered their pre-mine condition. So now it's 2015, and the same operator is back. Same hole, same equipment, same methodology. The local citizens group is the San Juan Ridge Taxpayers Association, and they have taken the lead to fight this thing on the direct evidence of the past. It would be completely nuts to jeopardize an entire community for the short-term operation of a gold mine. Rimley Scherzinger, the director of the Nevada Irrigation District, once told me that the single most valuable piece of infrastructure in a society is an intact aquifer. Once you dewater it and oxidize it, it will never be the same. Incompatible land use is the condition we have. Anxiety, diminished water security, permanent loss of land value, death of a community, these are some of the impacts we are facing. My home is reached by a three mile dirt road that crosses these diggings. Every time I cross through those ancient gravel beds, the past is squarely in front of me. We either face it and find the solutions, which are beyond us, or we ignore it and let the world continue to slide. As a culture, I truly feel that we're risking our identity as a civilization if we don't correct the mistakes of the past and start behaving as if we really want to be around for a while. So that brings us to 2012. I came to Izzy for advice, Izzy Martin, the director of the Sierra Fund, on how to fight this latest version of the mine. And of course, she gave hugely and freely and helped the SJRTA build effective strategy. Th that is when the mercury question came up. And I realized that our local battle was part of a much larger campaign throughout California. The integrity of watersheds are, in my mind, the missing element of California water policy. Our legacy of management in this regard is backwards. We started in the bay, cleaning up the bay. Then we moved to the delta. We tried to clean up the delta. And then we're on to the rivers. But we stopped at the dams, more or less. When 96% of the mercury found in the delta is from the mines, it would seem most prudent to clean up the old mines and eliminate the source. Thank you. The Sierra Fund has proven that new mercury is discharged every time there's a peak storm event. But this mercury is a direct health threat to California, but is also a powerful indicator of the central role that a healthy watershed contributes to our society. Here in Northern California, the watershed is the dominant feature of our mountain, river, estuary, bay system. By looking at how this system affects nearly all activity in our society, we get to understand how valuable it is, how much it still serves us in its diminished capacity, and how much richer, in all senses, we would be if our energies went to healing this system. What we need is the same as with biodiversity. We need water diversity. All kinds of water. Fast, then slow. Narrow, then wide. Clear, then deep blue. A watershed supported by rich, multi-aged forests. Willow-secured riverbanks. Floodplains not contained by armored riverbanks. Meanders, estuaries, clean bays. This is a vision for California that has tremendous precedence, for it is only a relatively short time that we have had an impaired watershed. And I believe the mechanisms for recovering the strength of healthy systems is well within our capacity. As easily as we broke it, we can devote the same energy to fixing it. We first need to identify our priorities, then the methods, then the desire, and then recognize the benefits. The essence of our work here and in the future are those four, th uh, those four things. This conference is all about that, all about figuring out how do we articulate where we want to go. So with that, I get to thank those that helped us make this conference possible. All of our sponsors are listed on the back of your conference program, but I also want to thank out loud our lead sponsors. California Department of Conservation, Tiffany and Company Foundation, California State University at Chico Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences, the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, Flower Essences Services, and of course the South Yuba River Citizens League. There's also additional sponsors, the Nevada Irrigation District, Tykert Materials, Holdridge and Call Engineers, Forger Associates, Gilder Associates, Ethical Metalsmiths, McCord Environmental, 
Shoot, Mahali, and Weinberger, attorneys at law. As you can see, uh, the Sierra Fund has built a broad partnership with everyone from academia, public agencies, private business, legal and environmental services, and conservation organizations, as well as members of the general public. We thank these other following organizations for their support at our conference as well. The California Indian Environmental Alliance, the Center for Creative Land Recycling, Consumness American Bear Yuba Integrated Regional Water Management Group, Fair Jewelry Action, Geocon, Indigenous Environmental Network, Western Mining Action Network, Reflective Images, the San Juan Ridge Taxpayers Association, Sierra Nevada Alliance, Sierra Water Work Group, Stoll Reeves, and the Wolf Creek Community Alliance. So there's those shout outs for those wonderful folks. I did it.